suffocating The quicksand's eating me alive The more I struggle, the faster I fall I'm crumbling from the weight of it all The world is whispering, you'll never get out I scream and I fight, but the quicksand's pulling me Sands eating me alive The more I struggle, the faster I fall kill about 10 seconds uh, before I started talking. So I just want to, on the front end of this, thank everyone who hopefully made this possible. I think there's like a 73% chance uh, that this is working. But anyway, I um, wanted to welcome you guys to uh, Chapel. Welcome to Chapel, right? Uh, here's something that I never imagined that we would be doing, and that is Chapel from my game room. But yet, here we are uh, in these very unique times. So I wanted to welcome you here uh, to chapel. I wanted to let you know, hey, when we did our text in chapel last week, I thought that was awesome. A lot of y'all were texting and asking uh, how we're doing. The Ellis family's thriving, uh, spending a lot of time outdoors, moved five yards of mulch. Uh, so that was fun, trying to get things cleaned up. And uh, it's been good. So miss you guys, though. And I do sincerely mean that. I miss, um, I miss being at school. I'm thankful that we have Microsoft Teams uh, where we can still hang out and do class. Uh, but I certainly miss seeing all of you in the hallways, and I know many of you feel the same way, and that's probably something you never thought you would say, uh, but that's where we are. Now, what I wanted to do is I just wanted to take a second and um, just talk to you guys about what's on my heart today uh, for all of us. I wanted to take a second and just share with you kind of what uh, the Lord has been showing me uh, throughout this season. So let me start with this. Um, 
We were on our way to Dallas for spring break. So we actually got to take our spring break trip to Dallas. Uh, drove down there and Austin Cox, Ethan Duell, both uh, shared with me a couple of links of two guys who are YouTube stars uh, who grew up in our environment. And by our environment, I mean like a Briarcrest, Christian, kind of like churched environment. And what was really interesting about listening to those guys is that uh, they spoke our language. And these two videos that they sent me are these guys sharing about how they once were Christians and are no longer Christians. They once were believers and they're no longer believers. And I, I mean, each video is like an hour and a half long. And as we were driving to Dallas, I was listening to those videos. And, you know, to be honest, like I teach apologetics. I'm certainly not the foremost expert on apologetics, but I do spend a lot of time thinking about these things. And none of the arguments they had were really frustrating to me. They weren't intellectually frustrating to me. A lot of the arguments that, that they had, they just kind of made me sad. Um, they made me sad because for me, I look at the Christian hope that we have. I look at the peace that we have. I look at um, just the things we get to discuss, the things we get to talk about, the things we get to see um, in our Christian faith. I look at those things um, and they bring me such peace and joy and comfort. And as you listen to these two guys, they're walking away from those things. And it was just really, really, really heavy. Now, here's what I want to say. At Briarcrest, um, and I know your church is the same way, one of the things we want to do is continue to give you opportunities to encounter Christ. And I think that's a good thing, right? Let me give you two examples real quick. The first one is this. Uh, while we're out on break, one of the things that we're working on, and by break, I mean while we're not physically at school, we're not technically on break. But while we're out, one of the first things we're working on right now digitally is a Briarcrest Student Ministries podcast. And so that's something within the next week or two we really hope to launch. And what we're going to use to kind of generate content is we're just going to use your questions. So you're going to be able to text in, send in questions. Um, you're going to be able to share with us kind of things that you're thinking about. You're going to be able to share with us uh, stuff you're wondering about or struggling with. And on that podcast, we're going to address those things. So stay tuned for that. The other thing we're going to try to do, and remember, I'm talking about just stuff we can do to grow spiritually right now. The other thing we're going to try to do is virtual breakout sessions next Monday. So next Monday is April 6th. We're going to do virtual breakout sessions. And high schoolers, we're doing this for the high school, um, but high schoolers, you know the drill. What we do is we get on uh, Sign Up Genius, and on Sign Up Genius, we're going to have all the breakout sessions listed, and then we're going to figure out a way, either with Microsoft Zoom or Teams, to create those portals so that you can sign on and have a virtual breakout session. But those are two things, and really two of many things, right? Like we're going live chapel from my house. Like we're still trying to continue that drumbeat of our love for Jesus right now. Um, but here's the thing about these two YouTube stars, back to what I was saying, these two YouTube stars that walked away from their faith. The thing that I noticed about both of their stories, they actually, when they graduated from high school and graduated from college, they went into ministry. Like their paycheck was tied to working for a particular ministry. And as they were in ministry, one of the things that, um, one of the things that within ministry that they were, uh, feeling was like, hey, I feel like I have to be a Christian. I feel like I have to be a Christian. I feel like I have to be a Christian. But then they left the ministry vocationally. And when they left the place where they were, where they felt like they had to be in ministry, they no longer wanted to be in ministry. I want to say that again. When they left the place where they felt like they had to be in ministry, they no longer wanted to be in ministry. Here's what I think is really interesting. I'm about to show you this in just a second. Here's what I think is really interesting. You're not physically at school right now. You're not. Like this is, this is unique uh, in the landscape of just kind of what we've done in our history as a school, right? You're not physically at school. But here's what I know is true. Some of you still want to follow Jesus. Even though you don't have to go to chapel, even, you, even though you don't have to do a lot of the things that you normally do, some of you still want to follow Jesus. And so my hope today is just to encourage you, if you want to follow Jesus, why that is encouraging. But I also want to kind of challenge you. Maybe you're like, do I want to follow Jesus? I'm not quite sure. I want to talk about that too. Now, there's a verse I want to use to kind of get us there. And this is the verse. It's 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. 
1 Peter 1, 6 through 7. Peter writes two things I want us to focus in on, all right? So here it is. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, he says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. All right, let me stop right there, because we're going to go to verse 7 and spend most of our time at verse 7. But I want you to look at verse 6 for a second. I love that Paul says this. He says, I mean, not Paul, Peter. He says two things. He says, grieved by various trials, but then he also says, if necessary. Now, various trials can mean various. In other words, like being stuck at home, away from friends, like that is a trial. I love that Peter didn't go, well, this type of trial or that type of trial. He says, hey, when difficulty comes your way. Now, let me say this for just a second, too. For me, maybe you're out there and you're still kind of skeptical if you can trust the Bible as like God's inerrant, infallible word, like our authority. Um, if you can trust it, like you're wondering about that. I love that the Bible is realistic. It doesn't say that everything's going to go perfect for you. It doesn't say that if you follow Jesus, life will be rainbows and unicorns. And I think I said this last week in our text in chapel, right? I love that the Bible is honest with, our, with us. Now, I've already covered that, so we don't need to spend too much time there. But look at what Peter says right here. He says, if necessary. Let me show you again. If necessary. Now, why is that important? Um, well, let me show you something. I've got three points, just in case you're taking notes. Uh, here's your first one. It's this. This has a purpose. Now, I don't just have to talk about like our like quarantine COVID-19 season that we're in. This has a purpose is much broader than that. It's whenever you go through a trial. Now, if you're like me, and I'm going to put our scripture back up on the screen for just a second so I can keep referencing back to it. If you're like me, you hate wasting time. Even when you're actually wasting time, you don't want it to really be a waste. You want it to be to some end. So even if you're like hanging out with your friends, just goofing off, having a good time, like you still want that to be something that is, you know, important to you, right? Like you want to hang out with friends and build relationships with them and all of those things. So one of the things that I think is really interesting with that is that a lot of us don't like wasting time. Let me tell you a story. Yesterday, my three-year-old wanted to ride his motorcycle. It's basically like a little bitty ATV. And what I did to hang this motorcycle up on the side of our garage, because they have all these little like toys you can ride on and want to be able to pull our cars in, I hung this, this little ATV thing on the side of the garage, but in order to get it to hang right, I had to take the wheel off, take the steering wheel off, and dismantle the whole thing. So I like had that in the storage room, but anyway, so he's like, I really want to ride it, I really want to ride it, I really want to ride it, so I'm like, okay, fine, so I get the ladder out, I get it down, I put the wheel on, I put the steering wheel back on, I try to find the pin for the steering wheel, I can't use it, so I grab a screw. Long story short, then I go and I find a charger that is the charger, and I go and find the charger, and what ends up happening is I plug the charger in, and when I plug the charger in, it doesn't work. And fortunately, we had another charger that I thought would work, so I plugged that charger in, and when I plugged that charger in, it didn't work either. And right then, I felt like 15 minutes of my life went to nothing, because at that point, I just wanted to like chunk the ATV onto the street. Hey, you're driving down the street, you can have it, right? Like, it just felt like a waste. So if you're like me, you're wasting time. And here's what we're tempted to think when we go through various trials, that it's a waste. But here's what Peter is basically promising us, in the word of God right now. He says this, those things are necessary, if necessary. Now, I've said this before and I'll say it again, it would be spiritual malpractice for me to right now try to tell you why you or we are going through what we're going through. I don't know what the answer to that is. I don't know what's on the other side of this. I don't know the lessons that God's trying to teach you and me, right? Like we can't see the fullness of that yet. But I love the fact that the Word of God promises us that God is working and He's moving and He has a purpose for what we're going through. And so I think that's really, really, really encouraging. Now, let's look at this. Let's go to verse 7. It says this, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, here is one of the purposes, I believe, uh, that various trials can serve. Okay? And let me, let me illustrate it, because I kind of alluded to it at the very beginning, but let me illustrate it this way. Um, in the high school, well, what we're seeing, this is, and if you're taking notes, number two, the genuineness of your faith. That's the second. So this is what we're going to look at right here. 
But in the high school, we are about to try something. I know y'all might have heard of no shave quarantine. What we're going to try, I mean, no shave November. What we're going to try to do is no shave quarantine. So let me give you the details of this. There's an April 7th deadline. Uh, that is the date that we are, uh, the day before we're supposed to be uh, returning to school. Um, what we want you to do, guys, we're going to give awards for the cleanest beard and the fullest beard. And we want you to email your pictures to Coach Stewart. So that's what we've got for you. No shave quarantine. Um, and, and I just kind of want to give you guys a preview, let you know what you're working against in case you haven't seen each other. Um, I got Matthew right here. He's, he's growing that. I think he might have shaved it. I, I'm almost positive he, sh he shaved that. But that's what he was working with. Uh, we got Landon, Landon Wright right here. So there's Landon. I think that might be like a day and a half. Uh, Landon can truly grow a five o'clock shadow. Uh, got Preston right here. So that, that's pretty impressive. And he trimmed up the neck, which I think looks nice. Uh, Keon Booker, I think he sneezed and that's what came out when he sneezed. So that's, uh, that's, that's Keon right there. All right, we got Batson right here. That's a nice hat, Batson. Um, in this picture, we got uh, Ash who is asleep. So that, I mean, once again, Ash, he probably sneezed and that's what came out. Now, I want you to know what you're aiming for, okay? So I want to show you a picture of a Briarcrest alum, class of 2019, who really can do this thing right. The Zach Yates, um, that is impressive, right? I don't know if any of us are going to get to that point uh, by the time it's time to come back to school. But once again, no shave quarantine. Now, here's what no shave quarantine is helping to illustrate for us. And I can also use the example of your uniform, okay? So I want you to think about this. Let's go back to our text. So here's our text. Most of you probably haven't been wearing your uniform. I just, I think it's safe to say that's true. And for those of you who have been, um, who have been uh, shaving, I think it's probably because you want to shave, not because you have to shave. And then we got some guys that haven't shaved. And what that goes to show is that, you know, you are shaving your face because you have to shave your face, not necessarily because you want to. So when you're free from the restriction of having to shave, do you still shave? When you're free from the restriction of having to wear your uniform, do you still wear your uniform? Now, right, like, hey, it's good to have to do those things. I think it's great when we come under authority and look, I mean, a lot of guys can't grow beards like that and we're doing that for you. So because if you tried to grow your facial hair out, it would not look that good. And so you're welcome. You can thank us on your graduation day. But here's my point, And let's tie this back into Christ for a second. And this is kind of the big question I want to ask you guys. It's this. Do you still want to follow Jesus? Do you still want to follow Jesus? Jesus, when you don't have to, when no one's making you. And this is honestly like what some of us are getting a preview of right now is like college. Because I think of my own college experience. I remember going to college and I think I've shared this with you guys, but I think it's worth repeating. I remember going to college and thinking, hey, you know what? When I'm out, like out from under kind of the, the places that I have to follow Jesus, when I get to college, am I really going to want to follow Jesus? And what ended up happening was when I got to college, I saw something well up inside of me where I was like, I think I do genuinely want to follow Jesus. And so now that you are kind of operating at least to some degree on your own at home where you might not have the announcements, we're praying over the announcements and you know, you can tune into chapel if you want, like, and you can read your Bible if you want. Do you still want to follow Jesus? Now, here's not what I'm asking. I'm not asking the question, are you not mad? I'm not asking the question, are you not frustrated? I'm not asking the question, are, are you not confused, perplexed, feel like you're knocked down, feel like things aren't right, feel like things aren't fair? Because I know if we're all honest, we've at least in some moments felt that way. Haven't we? Like, haven't we all felt like this just doesn't seem right, this just doesn't seem fair, I don't feel like this is... This is what's supposed to happen. I'm not asking that. Because look at what, look at what, here, let me, let me show you the, the verse one more time. Look back at the verse. I'm not asking you that. I'm asking you right now, in your trial, do you see a genuineness of faith? And what that genuineness of faith means, do you still want to follow Jesus even in the trial? 
through the tears, through the frustrations, through the unanswered questions, through the doubts, through the concerns, through all of it, do you still want to follow Jesus? Okay, so I was reading a, uh, I was actually reading a sermon yesterday, and I want to read you a quote from that sermon. I'm going to throw it up here on the screen. I'll read it from my papers. This is what it says. This is the quote. Um, and this might answer the question if you're sitting there and you're like, I don't know. I don't know if I want to still follow Jesus. I don't know if I still want to, to follow Christ. Listen to this. It's possible, for example, to grow up in a family or to spend time in a church filled with vital believers and say, I'm convinced of Christianity and I feel warm and inspired during services. And to be very active in the kind of things, and when you move away from the environment where all, where all that's happening, and you suddenly find God is completely unreal to you. You have no desire to pray, and you have no desire to go to church except when you're in trouble. And so that's what I'm talking about. It's like you're away from having to follow Christ, so you no longer want to follow Christ. So here's the question that's, that's asked, and this was a Tim Keller sermon. Um, he asked this, why? The answer is, though you were surrounded by people who had a relationship, you never got one yourself. You were in an environment filled with a certain warmth, but you never met him yourself in your own personal center. You never met him personally. You never met him as an individual. You never, look at that, look at that again. You never met him personally. You never met him as an individual. So it's kind of thinking back to this for just a second. What in the world does that mean? Now, now for some of us, you're sitting here and you're like, I do want to follow Jesus. And if you're anything like me, especially like freshman and sophomore year of college, I didn't really even have the theological grid work to figure out why I genuinely wanted to follow Jesus. I was just like, there's something about this guy where I don't have all my answers and things aren't always going well, but I really want to follow him and I really think he does love me. And so kind of the question I want us to ask is like, what does it look like to pursue Jesus? How do we find ourselves in a place where we genuinely want a relationship with him? All right, let me go back to our verse again, and then we're going we're gonna to go one more set of scripture, and then we're going to be done. So we are, we are kind of round and third heading for home, and that might mean another 15 minutes. Who knows? I mean, you don't have anywhere to go. Okay, so look back at verse 7. It says at the very end, uh, we see the genuineness of faith. Uh, more precious than gold, it perishes, though it is tested by fire. So it's talking about this idea that um, gold perishes, uh, but your faith won't if it's a genuine good thing. Um, Peter says this, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. May be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right, so I remember thinking through this text, um, praying through this text, actually preached on this text at, at one of our in-services a couple years ago. Uh, and when I studied it, there was something about this last, uh, these last couple of words that blew me away. And let me tell you what it is. If you look at this, maybe found a result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, when Jesus splits the sky open and he comes back and he fixes everything, he makes everything new, new heavens, new earth, all those good things. When Jesus does that, that's going to be a great thing. That's going to be a great day. That's going to be a day that we all should be very excited about. And we're going we're gonna to praise him, and we're going to glorify him, and we're going to honor him, and we're going to lay all our crowns at his feet. Yes, 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 amen. All of the scriptures point to that. But if you look at this text, this is not talking about that, even though that will be true. If you look at this text, what this is talking about is the praise and the glory and the honor that not comes towards Jesus, although that will be there. It's talking about what comes from Jesus to us. Some of you are like, what in the world does that mean? Let me, um, let me try to contextualize it real quick, and then we'll, we'll talk about our third point. Some of the reason why many of us are frustrated right now uh, is because uh, things that we held dear to us have been canceled, postponed. Um, and I get it. But that frustration might creep into something that is dangerous. And let me tell you what I'm talking about. If you're sitting there and you're like, I, I can't do this thing that I used to be able to do. Who am I and what is my purpose now? 
right? If, if that's what you're thinking versus like, man, I really wish I could play that sport. Man, I really wish I could be back at school. Man, I really wish I could see my friends. Man, I really wish. And some of you even right now are like, man, I kind of wish we were in chapel, which you never thought you would say, right? But it's not just that. It's this, who am I? What is my purpose? What is my meaning? What is my significance? And some of you, you're wrestling with God right now. Not, not because of the sadness, but because you're like, I, I don't have any purpose anymore. It was taken from me. And that, honestly, I think is where many of us, that's where our struggles are. Because we're sitting here, we're going, oh my gosh, I used to be this person. I used to see people who would affirm me. And now I have none of that. And what this does is this puts us in a situation. And I don't think that it is a negative thing. Because if the end of this is what it's about to be for Jacob, I think it's a good thing. But this puts us in a situation where we are wrestling with God. Where we're, we're, we're basically being like, God, why? Come on, who am I? What is my purpose? What is my meaning? You've taken all these things from me. Right? Like, we probably said those things. Now, just for a little bit of comedic relief, when I think of wrestling, I think of this picture. It's just one of my favorite pictures. Um, <laughs> Coach Bennett. You gotta love it. Okay, so that's... <laughs> we'll take that off. But, wrestling with God. Now, I want to I wanna end with, with this story because I think about wrestling. And I think about um, when my brother and I used to wrestle. Uh, I think about when I watch my kids wrestle. Um, sometimes when they're doing that, they're wrestling over something that they find valuable. They're wrestling over something that they find important. They're wrestling over something that, that all of them want and they want to get it, right? Okay, so keep that in mind. And let me take you to a text that I think helps us understand what Peter's talking about in 1 Peter. So I want you to look at this real quick. What we have right here is a story of Jacob. Now, I covered this in chapel about two years ago. Uh, so let me give you a quick refresher. But this is the story of Jacob. And Jacob was, I mean, for lack of a better word, he was a scoundrel. Jacob was this guy who um, was always trying to weasel his way into something. He tried to weasel his way into his birthright. He tried to weasel his way um, into all sorts of different scenarios where he came into money and came into wealth and came into this. It was just, he, he just was a weasel, right? Like that's, that's the best way to sum it up. And all of his weaseling in Genesis 32 catches up to him. And so he has to split his family up. He has to send him away. He's all by himself. He's wondering uh, if his brother Esau is about to cross, cross the, the, the plane and come and kill him. Like, and not, a, not a good scenario for Jacob. So he's there alone in his tent. And all of a sudden, this random guy shows up and starts wrestling with Jacob. Now look at this. It says right here, And a man wrestled with him, Jacob, until the breaking um, of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, look at this. He touched Jacob's hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Now, I've wrestled with my brother. Uh, we have, guys have wrestled around before. It would be nice to have this kind of power where you could just touch somebody's hip, and their hip just kind of pops out of socket, right? And that's what happened to Jake, Jacob. Jake. That's what happened to Jacob. And if you look later on in the text, what you'll see is he always walked with a limp. And what Jacob realized, though, right here in verse 25 is that he's not wrestling with a man. He's wrestling with God. That's who he's wrestling with right here in verse 25. Now, if you keep reading, if you look at verse 26, it says this, Then he said, Let me go, for the day is broken. So Jacob, Jacob is realizing, like, this is God, and here's why. No one could live after seeing God's face. And so God's like, it's dark. I need to go. If I don't go right now, you're not going to be able to, sit. you're, you're going to die, right? So, so he's like, I need to go. And Jacob's like, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. And this is one of those texts that is just kind of odd if you don't know what you're looking at, right? This is kind of one of those things where you always hear like, Hey, you need, to, you need to read your Bible. So then you go and read Genesis 32, and you're like, this is weird. Jacob's wrestling with some rando dude. Uh, then Jacob is over here, and when the guy's wrestling with him, he touches his hip socket, and then Jacob wants a blessing from the guy before he lets him go. What? But I think about Jacob, and I think about just his story, and I parallel it with my story, and I'm trying to parallel it with your story. So many of us, we are living for the applause of people. We are living for people to affirm us, to tell us that we've done a good job, 
to tell us that we matter, to tell us that we have a purpose, to tell us that we have a meaning. And remember earlier when we talked about the fact that this trial has a purpose, right? We're like, that's great, but do I have a purpose? Do I have meaning? Do people care about me? Do, do, do I matter? Right? Like so many of us, we've wondered that. We're curious about that. We want to hear. And here's who you want to hear it from. You don't want to hear it from somebody you don't think matters. You don't want to hear it from somebody you don't think is important. You want to hear it from somebody whose opinion truly matters. That's what you want. You want somebody who you look at and think, you think the world of that person and they look right back at you. And they say, I think the world of you. That's what we want. And honestly, that's what Jacob wanted. That's what Jacob was looking for all of his life. And some of us, the reason we're so frustrated right now is because we don't even have a glimpse of that. Because the people that we did kind of view in that light, we don't get to see them as much anymore. So we don't get to hear that praise. So we're just sitting here and we're frustrated and we're wondering if we really matter and if people are listening to us and if we have a purpose and we have a meaning and that's where we find ourselves. Now, let me say a quick side note, and this is just a reminder from something that Ms. Longworth said. I think it was Ms. Longworth that said this last week. Uh, many of you are struggling with loneliness, and that's not necessarily what I'm talking about um, with this. You just feel alone. And for those of you who are extroverts, I would continue to encourage you to keep reaching out to people. Keep letting people know that you care. P keep letting people know that you're there for them. Don't let people um, feel like they're all alone. Uh, especially if you're kind of one of those people who's like me, where you could quite literally just sit there and stare at a camera and talk for 30 minutes. Like if that's, if that's who you are, then I want you to continue to reach out to people. All right, side note over. That's what Jacob was looking for. All right, so let me show you verse 27. Look at this. And he said to him, what is your name? So God was speaking to Jacob, and God already knew the answer. What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your and this is why he said it. Um, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. You have stri stri striven, 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 I think it's striven, striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? Now, these last couple words, these last five words down here, I counted really quickly. These last five words are very important. It says, and there he, God, blessed him, Jacob. Now, in that day, a blessing was verbally committed. And this would have been God looking at Jacob and saying, you matter. You're important. I care about you. I love you. Right? Like, how, how much we long to hear those words from somebody that we think matters. And Jacob, like I said, he walked with a limp. Yes, he also got a new name, Israel. He got a new name and he walked with a limp. For the rest of the time, right? For the rest of his life. But yet he knew he mattered and he knew he had purpose and his life had meaning because the very God of the universe told him so at the end of verse 29. Now what in the world does this have to do with us? Some of you are like, man, how could I hear God say that to me? Okay? That, and, that's, and that's an interesting question. I want to I frame it up this way. I promise I'm almost done because I'm going to put up this scripture verse right here. Um, I'm going to show you a video and then we really are done. I want you to think about praise and glory and honor that comes from Jesus. And then I want you to think about what we said earlier where like personally encountering Jesus and this not just being head knowledge but heart knowledge because I think one of the things we're, we, we rightfully seek to do at school is we want to fill you with the head knowledge of who Jesus is because you got to know who he is before it changes your heart. But I want you to think about something right now. If you've watched any sort of news coverage, um, if you've seen anything on social media, what you've most likely seen is praise for uh, first responders, praise for doctors, praise for nurses, um, praise for some of our government officials and our scientists, praise for people working at Costco, people working at Kroger, people continuing to put their health on the line so that we can continue to live as we are, right? Like, we've probably heard some of that. You know, I was reminded yesterday uh, Luke Braswell actually sent me a, a, a GIF, GIF, I don't know. It's like striven, striving. It's one of the two. But he sent me this, and he reminded me of something. Um, many of you might be familiar with this video. I'm going to show it. Kevin Durant, back in 2014, won uh, MVP uh, in the NBA. And he gave this speech that probably is one of the best MVP, MVP speeches ever because he basically deferred his MVP to his mom. I want to show you just a 
glimpse of this. Then we're going to talk about why this has to do with you. And then we're going to end by closing. So watch this real quick. Let me set it up. There's the clip. Let me full screen it. And then let me hit play. And when, you, when something good happens to you, I don't know about you guys, but I tend to look back to what brought me here. And you wake me up in the middle of the night in the summer times, making me run up a hill, making me do push-ups. He's talking to his mom. Screaming at me from the sideline of my games at eight or nine years old. We wasn't supposed to be here. You made us believe. You kept us off the street. Put clothes on our backs, food on the table. When you didn't eat, you made sure we ate. You went to sleep hungry. You sacrificed for us. <laughs> You're the real MVP. I love that video and let me explain why. I think that video is incredible because if you watch that video, what you're seeing is Kevin Durant knows that he's loved. Kevin Durant knows that he's loved because there is someone who has sacrificed for him. And ups and downs in the NBA, ups and downs as he's playing basketball throughout his youth, didn't matter because his mom sacrificed for him. Did you hear that? He said, hey, there were times that you didn't eat so that we could eat. He knew he was loved and he was, he was kept safe in that love and he's flourishing and he's saying, hey mom, you're the real MVP. Okay, here's why this is important because some of you, you're wondering, because remember our quote earlier, this was our, this was our quote we were looking at. Um, you have never, uh, uh, you've never met him yourself in your own personal center. You have never met him personally. You have never met him as an individual. Let's look back at our verse one last time. Here's what I think happens when that goes from head knowledge to heart knowledge. You realize that the glory and the praise and the honor that you are seeking from other people, the glory and the praise and the honor that you're trying to find from someone you deem as significant is found in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. When I think about that for myself, and I wonder, does anybody care? Does anybody notice me? Is it, I mean, I, I struggle with those exact same things that I'm talking about. It's not just you, right? Like there's not some like, you reach the age of 23 and you stop struggling with this stuff. Sometimes it gets worse. And when I feel that way, and maybe I'm laying my head on my pillow at night and I'm drifting off to sleep and I'm wondering, do I matter? Do I care? Do people notice me? I'm wondering all of those things. Here's what I keep reminding myself of. I remind myself of the praise and the glory and the honor that comes from Christ and is found in the crucifixion. Where you look at John 3.16, you see God the Father, your heavenly Father in Christ, saying, I love you enough to send Jesus to die for you. You look at Jesus and Jesus is saying, I love you enough to die for you. You look at the Holy Spirit who's saying, I love you enough to indwell you, to show you who Jesus is, to show you who God the Father is. And listen, I'm promising you, when that goes from head knowledge to heart knowledge, we're still going to be frustrated. We're still going to be sad. We're still going to be confused. And we're still going to have unanswered questions. But in the middle of that, you're going to see that your faith is truly genuine because you truly want to follow Jesus. Not because we're telling you to. Not because you have to. But because you want to. Because you know that's where life is found. So with that being said, let me pray for us. Uh, and then we'll be done. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much just for uh, this afternoon and really the technology to, to get to have a conversation with just um, the Briarcrest family today. Lord, I want to pray for everybody who's watching this right now and will watch it later. Uh, people are just struggling the same way I am. And just the, the kind of the, the confusion and just what feels like the ups and downs of all of this. Lord, would you, um, God, would you give us a comfort and a peace that is found in, in you. God, would you just right now um, move in our lives in a way that is uh, just reminds us that you're there. God, the circumstances might not change, but Lord, if you frame them up in the middle of your love, God, we know that we're cared about. We know that we're loved. And we can trust because you took the confuse, confusing, seemingly pointless, blood-stained cross and you turned it into an empty tomb that even though right now this time seems purposeless, frustrating, there's a purpose for it. And so God, we're thankful for that. Lord, I'm thankful for you. 
I'm thankful for the words of blessing that you give us through your word, your authoritative, perfect, infallible word that tells us that we are loved, that we are cherished. And because that is true, would we then return um, and worship you which is a reckless abandonment in good times and in bad. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in. I'm going to go try to figure out how to turn this off, but I hope all of you have a fantastic rest of your day and fantastic rest of your week.